physically and everything else. Uh, uh, been trying to just get into my uh, garage and studio and dig up old songs that have been sitting there for like 25 years and seeing what, you know, what I can finish, that type of idea, you know, as far as uh, uh, finishing, you know, uh, uh, songs and stuff. But for live, there's not much going on at all, you know, uh, especially out, out here in Vancouver. And even when I moved out here from Toronto, uh, the music scene over here was more or less like uh, I ended up playing like cover stuff, you know, more more or less as far as the original, you know. Mm -hmm. So I ended up uh, doing more of that. And uh, and now that with it, when the COVID hit, I says, I'm going to get into that computer and dig up stuff. So that's what I've been trying to do is just piece together stuff that that I can actually uh, uh, finish, you know, and, and be proud of, you know. Awesome. Yeah. So where did it all begin for you, Frank? Just for people that don't know. And like I said, I, I don't. I don't know you as a man. I've seen you perform. I know you're, you carry a name in the music industry. I know you've got some real connected friends and some musically genius friends. But where did it all start for you? Well, basically, I grew up in a town uh, uh, up, up northern BC, Kitimat, you know. Uh, my dad had uh, immigrated from, uh, from Italy years before. And, uh, you know, we grew up in that town. And there was, you know, not a heck of a lot to do. So we started... Uh, I, you know, the Beatles came out, of course, and bang, you know, we started picking up guitars. Now, my dad, he was actually a musician himself, and he had been in the war, like in uh, in England. He was a prisoner of war there, learned to speak very good English and write English stuff. So he was a, kind of ahead of his time there. But for some strange reason, he always wanted to keep us away from, he always thought, oh my God, he's uh, getting into uh, uh, guitars and stuff. And that was when the days when there was, you know, drugs, you know, long hair. So you got to stay away from that stuff. So he tried to keep me away from it, but he actually couldn't, you know, so I was sneaking out and playing all the time. And, and then finally he ended up buying me my first SG guitar, you know, so he kind of gave up on me. He says, uh, Academically, this guy's not going to be a lawyer or a, or a doctor or whatever. So I ended up just packing my guitar and just uh, traveling up and down the uh, BC doing cover stuff. All right. You know, in uh, in, uh, uh, in in all the bars because you could play there like five nights a week, literally in the in the bars there. It was a great like uh, training session for musicians. I found uh, in BC, you could just go to the next hotel play for five days, you have a room, you know, place to stay, you know, and, and it was also a, a, a good way for the band, you know, to sort of tighten, you know, get tight and, and, and play together and then, you know, develop, uh, develop from there. So I, I found that that was a really good training ground. And, and there was a lot of great musicians like up in, up north, uh, in, in uh, like the terrorist Kitimat area. Uh, you know, people like uh, like Jim Valance grew up there, uh, and 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 uh, my drummer from the Imps used to play with him. You know, and uh, um, there was musicians like Skip Press would come from uh, who ended up playing with Sweeney Todd later. Uh, he ended up coming up and playing with some of his bands, uh, and 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 uh, uh, Kevin Nickel. And uh, just many guitarists and musicians that would come and travel up and down BC it was a great time to do that. And you could just learn a lot just by, uh, uh, you know, going from uh, uh, hotel to hotel and then uh, learning new songs and then getting better at your instrument and your craft, you know. So how old are you in these days when you're going up and down the coast? Pardon? How old are you these days when you're going up and down the coast? When I was going up and down there, I was in my... Well, I started like I, I it was about, I was about uh, 17 or, or, or 18, you know, like, around, you know, around that time. And Thor came out from, uh, he came from Hawaii to, to do a show up in Kitimat. We were just teenagers, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, we had to be his backup band, you know. So we, so we started around, you know, like 17, 18, or, uh, around that time anyway. I can't remember the exactly, but uh, we, we were his backup band. Uh, at, at the at the uh, at the chalet in, in in Kitimat, which is a hotel there, kind of, uh, and and fr and from there, you know, uh, I I just ended up, you know, hitting the road because you could go down and, and go from uh, like uh, it was Terrace, Kitimat, Prince Rupert, like uh, mm -hmm. uh, Prince George, and all the way down right down to Vancouver, you know, and so so it, it's it's about that time that I started just 
like I say, just packed on my guitar and I basically lived on the road, you know? Mm -hmm. So you building your craft while you're touring as a young guy? Yes. Yes. That's what I did. I, 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 because my dad didn't want me to play when I was going through high school, he always tried to push me into like, uh, well, you got to study, you got to do this, you got to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. So I never really got into it. And, and it's unfortunate because like he could read and write music and he would play in the, in the, uh, uh, in, in the orchestra there. He played, he played violin and he played guitar and stuff. And, but he never pushed me that way, you know? So I, I, cause, cause he always thought I, I was just trying to do everything by ear. You know, and, and you're sitting there and, you know, you're trying to slow down like a, a Zeppelin album or, uh, you know, or a Santana and trying to figure out what, what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in a way, I kind of uh, I missed out a lot because later when I hit the road, I got books out and I studied, you know, like some some classical and, and, and some theory and things like that. And I had to do that all on my own, you know. Mm -hmm. So if, if you would have kind of encouraged me a little bit earlier, I thought that, that I probably could have. Uh, you know, like sped up my, 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 uh, my learning these days on YouTube, you can just boom, open it up and your five year, five year old kids can play that stuff. You know, but mm -hmm. when we were doing that, man, you had to sit there and pick out every little note. What's he doing? How's he bending this? And what, <laughs> that type of idea. So it's, it was a real good learning. Uh, like I said, it was a very, uh, a, a good learning ground, you know, for us, you know, playing these clubs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, then sitting up in our hotel room, like I said, during the day, nothing else to do, you know, but pick right. up our instrument, you know, and so, girls. <laughs> did you ever have uh, like a career or a job in the background or have you always made music your industry? Well, no, I'll tell you what I did was I, when I uh, left Kitimat, i never had a job uh, at all. The only thing I did was uh, in Kitimat, there's a, uh, aluminum plant up in Kitimat and, and uh, uh, you know people would work there and then they would uh, make enough money so they, they could uh, uh, you know say take the summer and, and, and just travel or do stuff you know I think I worked there just for a little while just to grab enough money so that I could hit the road you know like mm -hmm. maybe grab you know you know pay for the rest of my amp that, that I, I had at the time or whatever and then uh, that's all I did so that's the only job I had and every once in a while, when uh, we were traveling up and down BC, like for, for those years, you know, those, those years in, in the 70s, you know, if something would happen, I would always have to go back home or something like that. You know, my, my, my mom would, 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 would say, no problem, we, we we're welcome there. And I'd bring the, the band sometimes, she'd cook for us, you know, that type of thing. So I never really had a job, you know? Right. Uh, the, the odd time I would... Uh, I, I would uh, uh, pick up extra money like uh, at, at, I was playing a place in I think it was Burns Lake or something and I was running out of money so that so the guy that we were playing at, at the his hotel the Burns Lake Hotel I can't remember I think that was the name of it but uh, and, and he said well maybe in the afternoon you can go there and uh, you know sell ice cream or something like that you know during you're in the afternoon or something like that so I did something like that to pick up some extra money but never did anything and then I just ended up like when Thor said, let's go to, uh, uh, you know, I had been traveling up and down BC for quite a few years, okay. uh, but say a few. And then he said, uh, let's go to Toronto because he had this recording type of uh, uh, possibilities and all these things like that. Okay. And ever since then, I, I just made a career out, out, out of music. We, we just traveled and played. And then, of course, you know, I started recording, you know, and then it, it got better and better. Until uh, I, I semi-retired when I came out to Vancouver, though, when my dad got ill in the late 80s, oh, okay. uh, he got very ill. And then I had to make a decision. So I had to kind of uh, uproot from, from, uh, from um, uh, Toronto. Mm -hmm. So in the late 80s or early 90s, I, when I moved here, I ended up, I didn't really want to, per se, tour. I was kind of, you know, burnt out a bit from mm -hmm. it anyway, you know, by that time, you know after having recorded albums and toured and did all that. And then I end, ended up getting like a, like a part-time uh, like, like day job over here, but still played music as well too. So that, 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 that's the only time I ended up doing something that, that was a day job was when I moved back to Vancouver. So how long about are you in Toronto then? How long did you pull the circuit down in Toronto then? Your... Well, in Toronto, I, I was there from like, uh, ooh, 
I, I was there like almost till I, till I left from the, the mid seventies, right up till the very, the late eighties, I, I, oh. I was there. Oh, okay. But like I said, but, but towards the, the late eighties, I, uh, um, you know, I, I, I was touring the, the same old show, uh, you know, and, and, and I was getting a bit tired of it myself too, you know what I mean? Because you can only blow your head up so many times, <laughs> you know, by that time you wanted to do something. And I remember this specifically, uh, in the mid eighties, somewhere around there, I was playing with, uh, Brian Gagnon was playing, uh, with me in the band. And, uh, he, he, what he did was he would take his little studio on the road and he would always uh, say we should spend more time, uh, you know, in, in the studio and, and, and recording and doing things, you know, because he had come from a band called The Hunt. I don't know if you ever heard of them. They, they were a, a local Toronto band. Mm -hmm. And I got together with him and uh, uh, Glenn Grotto who was the drummer. Um, and, and they had played together before in, in a band called Bull Rush years and years earlier. Now, we ended up touring and, and we had a good following. So we'd tour across Canada and we could you know, support a, a big road crew. We could support like a video crew. We could support like, um, uh, you know, like, like uh, 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 our manager and everything else. And, and, and everyone was, was making good money at the time. So, uh, uh, it, so we kind of didn't want to disrupt that, but, uh, Glenn, but uh, Brian Gagnon said, I think I'm going go to go back after this tour and just start recording. And that's kind of one of the things I probably should have done more of. I should have just said, you know what, let's just go back and just, uh, uh, you know, do some more recording, get him more involved in that. Because he uh, became uh, uh, a super good at, at, at being an engineer, producer, and, and doing stuff. So... Uh, I, I, I wish I, I would have done a bit more of that because uh, right now, even in my studio at home here, like I'm good for doing demos, but I always go to my friends that are very, very good engineers and stuff. And, you know, and, and they, they're just so more, uh, much more knowledgeable with that, you know? Right. Yeah. So where did the, where did the Frank Soda show that I know, Soda Man, where did that inspiration all come from? I think that when I saw you, I remember like a Jack in the box uh, head that you wore, but I've seen the TV of say, you know, you say, how many times can you blow up your head? I want you, I asked you to do that for me today. I guess you're not going to do that. I don't see <laughs> Where'd that whole, uh, the, uh, the image and the branding and, and the specifically the blowing up the head at the end of the show, where'd that all come from? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, what happened was uh, it, it came when, when we were, when we first hit Toronto and we were playing like with Thor, we, we used to open the show. The MPs used to open the show. Now he had a very theatrical show. Like, I mean, I wish we would have had, you know, like cell phones back then because he did have a, a fabulous show, like, you know, entertainment wise, you know, he would like, you know, pick me up and I had a long uh, corridor. I was wireless and he, you know, grabbed me with one hand and literally lift me, lift, lift me over his head while I was playing the guitar solo run on the audience. He would break up uh, bricks over his chest. Like someone from the audience would come up and smash him with a, <laughs> with, with a sledgehammer and things like that. Right. You know, and, and of course, you know, strobe lights and, and lights and all right. stuff. And, uh, and, and he also would blow up hot, hot water bottle till it burst. And anyway, people just loved that, that show. So when we opened up for them, you know, I thought, well, geez, you know, like, I mean, he's doing this, uh, this, you know, fabulous show when he comes on. So when he was out doing other things, we had to develop, you know, something for ourselves, you know, so the imps and, 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 and that the whole, uh, blowing up the head stuff actually came from a, an original song I had, which was, uh, which was, um, um, called TV people. Oh, yeah, it, it was called TV People, and it was about kind of getting brainwashed by by television, which kind of we all do and everything else, you know, like, I mean, you just, that's what it's all about, really, just for commercials and stuff. So I had that image in my head, and we were on our way to a gig, and I said, Jesus, there was a TV lying on the side of the road. I said, <laughs> you know, I, so I said, I just said to myself, you know, we should gut that out and, you know, you know, experiment. Maybe I can blow that up on my head. It would be funny. And it was just talk. Next thing you know, you know, you know, we, uh, you know, 
<laughs> we, we we actually actually did it. We, we took it apart, gutted it out, and, and just put it so it fit on my head. Yeah. And then we actually put the, the 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 flash bomb because we had seen like some of the the concussion cannons that Kiss used, you know, be, be, like at, around that time, you know, because that was our first introduction to Toronto was uh, you know, Thor. And, and the imps were presenting Kiss with their gold album and Maple Leaf Gardens and stuff. And when their show came on and these cannons came on, they were so bloody loud. I said, how did they do that? And it was called, it was this concussion powder that, that they would, they would put in, you know, but I said, well, I, I don't want to blow, I don't want to, you know, blow my head right off. So we, we, we kept putting it further away until the right, the, the right kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, the right mixture would, 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 wouldn't sort of, jolt the, the guitar so it ripped my head off and then i put it on my head and er, ever since then you know the, the, the there started the exploding heads <laughs> yeah wow, man. so you, it all the inspiration was you gotta you gotta keep pace or try to outdo well you can outdo thor probably in those days but that's where you had to keep pace with him eh well, well, basically, like it, it was one of those things where where I, I always felt like you, you go to a show, you know, and and yeah, the band can stand there and play, but it, it was always like uh, you know, when someone always did something that you know, I I kind of enjoyed it too. Like if I see someone on stage and and, and he's doing something a bit different, you know, it, it was it was funny. I mean, I went maybe overboard with with all the heads because I said, Jesus, you no, know, I I blew that one up. Now I got. I had a song called Moon Man and I had a big round ball. I was like, oh yeah, we'll blow that up too. And it became one of those things, you know, but in, in a way, like, like it, it, the show kind of like, you know, took over the, like, like the music in, in a sense, if you know what I'm saying, the, the, the show was good. The musicians were good. The, the imps were, were a good tight, like, like band, but we, we went too much show. It was 80%, 90% show, 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 as opposed to us just, coming back and just working on the music, you know, that that's what I found. I, I didn't do enough of that, you know? Interesting. Who yeah. was your drummer, man? Your drummer was filthy. I went back in the, in the archives oh, the yeah. last night and just, oh man, some of those old tunes. I never had a Frank Soda album, sorry. Uh, but I was <laughs> like everything for me, it was live entertainment, right? So uh, who was playing drums on the majority? Well, you know what? Unfortunately, you know, uh, this is a very sad story in, in a sense, like I'm going to tell you about John. John Le Chasseur was his name in, in the Imps, right? He's the guy that we all headed out. Me, uh, Charlie Towers, and John Le Chasseur were the, the Imps, we were called. They, we were headed out, and we were Thor's backup band, and then later we got our own five-album deal with Quality Records and all that stuff like that. No, he, that was the original band. It was, it was uh, John Le Chasseur was the drummer. He's the fellow that that was when I, when I met him, he was playing with Jim balance up, up in, uh, uh, in Terrace. Uh, he would play drums for Jim while Jim would, uh, would play piano for, for certain acts that would come to town. And, uh, and him and his brother, uh, was a singer and, uh, they would get together with, with Jim balance and they have these bands and they have fun, you know, playing and singing together and doing stuff. So that's when I met him and I thought, wow, this guy's a fabulous drummer. So when we got, the invite from Thor, he was my my first guy to, to call. You know, like I played with him before, and uh, and then you know you know fast forward to a, a few years back, you know, we we kind of uh, sort of reunited again because we we had separated for quite a while. You know, we would reunited. He had moved back up north, and he was doing sort of well. And then I'd heard that he'd had a heart attack and stuff. But then we kept in touch. You know, he says, "Oh yeah, I had one, but he was doing fine." And we reunited to do a benefit that I do here every year for uh, uh, for the Liver Society. We we get local bands like from from Prism, you know, to uh, uh, well Lee Aaron did it, you know, like and and, and all the bands uh, Ray Roper and Stone Bolt and, and uh, we 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 do it to to raise money for uh, for that charity. And I says, well, let's reunite and do uh, uh, like a, an Imps thing, you know. So actually, when he came up, we started uh, um, we started uh, talking about well, let, let's just do a you know, let's get back and doing a couple of songs about the old days. We talked about this and that, and we were actually doing it. And then he had a massive heart attack. Uh, about, I guess about almost going on two years now, uh -huh. and he didn't make it. You know, so it was sad. But he was the drummer there. John Lechasseur was the guy, and he 
to this day, like he was a phenomenal musician, not only a good drummer, but he was very good, like as far as uh, uh, writing and doing stuff like uh, um, in the studio, you know, uh, creating ideas. He was, he was fantastic. Last night when I was going through a bunch of uh, your old tunes, it occurred to me that there's there's some sort of thread that's woven through Canadian music. It's almost like you can hear it. I don't care if you're talking, you know, April Wine or Trooper or even maybe Max Webster, but so many of these Canadian bands had a real feel, had a, I don't know what to, how to describe it, but it's almost like you could say, oh, that, that's a Canadian sound right there. Do you, do you ever notice that? And what do you think it is? Gee, that's hard to to pinpoint. I do notice that they, 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 the Canadian bands have that. Um, uh, I, I just think that uh, the American bands uh, or, 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 or other bands just have more of a something that they, you know, they have they, they have something that they, in in their mind that they that they have to create and it's been done before or whatever. But the Canadian bands, like I said, I mean, like look at Larry Gowan's uh, song "Criminal Mind." Who would have thought that would have been a hit? Uh, you know, and then and then you go on on to something like April Wine, and they do very commercial songs, commercial sounding. Mm -hmm. Yet to me, they're cool. You know, so I think that the only way I can describe it is like like. Uh, it, it's a cool way to, to, to make a, a um, yeah, Canadian bands have a cool way of making a commercial song sound good, you know, mm. so, something like that. Because it's, if, 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 if you listen to some of the songs, uh, they're almost like, yeah, that's a hit, if you know what I mean, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but like I said, uh, um, I, I think that the Canadian bands just, just uh, they, they have their own way of just, taking like the British, the American and, and just everything, you know, kind of, you know, it, it, it's the Canadian way. That's all, that, I guess that's all I, I, I can think of, you know? Now, I know you've got many friends in the business. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, your Max Webster friendship and who is it? Is it Wilkinson on drums there? What, what Terry Watkinson? Watkinson, yeah, sorry. What, what, what the keyboard player you mean? For my interviews, I, <laughs> Watkinson. I should know that because <laughs> I was Terry. a huge man. I was huge Max Webster fan. My a friend of mine, Mike Dixon, used to still plays in town called uh, Loud Shirts. He had a connection with the art director, Russia's art director. I think him and uh, Mike were fans, and Mike was the he worked at the beer store, and he had that huge mustache. He was on moving pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, in in the, in the artwork and his a friend of my family worked with mike dixon at the beer store and that friend brought over moving pictures for me that oh man that was almost where it all started for me for rock and roll in the early 80s oh and, yeah and uh jim festchuck was his name and he gave me this album he says you know is this is this is the new acid rock it's really not my thing and the yeah, acid rock i didn't know what the hell that was but he, <laughs> he introduced me to that and then the crossover with rush on the uj album uh with uh battle scar was oh man that was just mind-blowing but uh who were some of your friends that you collaborated with and maybe were inspired by back in the day well um uh... Well, put it this way: When I first uh, hit Toronto, I, I saw um, Rush and Max Webster. And Max Webster opened up for mm -hmm. for, uh, for Rush, and as soon as I saw them, I I, I thought, yeah, it, Kim Mitchell w was the guitar player. You know, to me, that, that he was the guitar player that I would sort of try to emulate because he was he was a a, a studied guitar player. He was cool. Uh, he was funny, if you know what I mean, uh, and and it just uh, he was he he was an all around like uh, you know uh, uh, like to me that he, he was the, he was the guy that 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 took uh, 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 sort of the, um, the the element of playing guitar like like a flashy, if you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. but but yet but yet he made it cool and funny that type of thing, you know, the, the Frank Z he had that Frank Zappa thing in there which I really liked, you know. Uh, so he was one, you know, definitely when I hit Toronto, that he was an influence of that. But when I was just, you know, actually starting to uh, to actually play guitar, like I said, uh, I, I was listening to like Jeff Beck or, or say, uh, you know, um, uh, blues guitar players and uh, and also uh, 
uh, like Led Zeppelin, of course, you know, but uh, uh, um, I, I would say uh, like San Carlos Santana, you know, they, they're very blues based, you know, stuff. And, and yet, when, when in the 70s, it, like I said, it's hard to, to say, what is that guy doing there? We had to sit there and really listen to the album, like I was saying earlier. And guys like, uh, like I say, uh, uh, Kevin Nickel would come up. These guys from Vancouver would come up and they'd be so, so much more advanced. So I learned from people like them and Skip Press. That I, would, I, would, I always watched and admired him. I said, wow, he's so cool. He plays, he plays guitar so well. And he was, uh, you know, and, and I, I, I would steal his licks and, and see what they're doing. So it was more or less because you really couldn't see like Jimmy Page live then, if you know, all the time, you know. These are the guys that I sort of built built on, you know. I, I you know, see what they're doing and, and pick up from there, and then, you know, piece together more uh, ideas and more 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 scales and 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 things that uh, and licks that that they were doing. But like I say, when I first hit Toronto, uh, I, I even even over Alex Lyson, it was it was uh, it was uh, Kim Mitchell for sure, you know. Wow, that's awesome. Now. I find that, you know, music seems to be about uh, what we're passionate about, obviously. And it seems like for most rock and roll, just about any type of music, it's I'm falling in love. I've got a broken heart. <laughs> I'm falling in love. I'm falling out of love. I don't know that your music fits in that category. What did you find yourself writing? And I've seen it. It's funny that you brought up Frank Zappa because... I've seen you referred to as the Canadian Frank Zappa. I know you had some ma some great humor with some some songs that were topical and were like, "What? Whoa, what's he really talking about here?" You well, you know about? what? The the funny thing is is that uh, you know you know it, it's kind of like sort of a uh, uh, you know when someone re relates you to someone like Frank Zappa. I mean, you, you can't even compare. You know, what I mean, uh, someone you know me to someone like that. But to be honest with you, uh, a, a lot of the stuff that, that I was doing then, I could have gone that route, uh, Frank Zapp. I had that, that, that mindset that I, I would, would like to do it. But some of the songs, like I was writing songs like the perverted Pinocchio, for example, stuff like that, that would never get recorded. Right. And, and it was all about like a girl saying, lie to me, lie to me, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you, know, you know what would happen then, you know? And, 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 and I can set up the scene. I had songs like that. And to be honest, you know, like I say, during this lockdown, I've been, I've been digging up some of the old songs, and that's one of them that came up. The perverted Pinocchio, or, or all all these old weird songs that I was writing, but you know, record companies are not gonna gonna record that. So that's why I had to, you know, go with the high times, Saturday Night Getaway, and 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 things like that. Like, you know, you know, but the Frank Zappa stuff, uh, you know, uh, getting you know, sort of compared to someone like that. I mean, he had his, his whole life was about like that. Totally, I couldn't even you know come close to doing anything like that in in the in the ballpark of what he did. You know, what do you mean with, specifically with his, his whole life? What do you mean? Pardon? What do you mean about that? His whole life was that. I mean, I know he's a musical genius and put a lot of time into it, but what do you mean his whole life? Well, th that guy basically, you know, he he would just sit there and and and. Uh, eat sleep and 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 just and and do music all the time that that's mm -hmm. all he did you know okay and uh, he had that mindset where he he, he didn't want to uh um uh have have any restrictions if you know what i'm saying like right. he, he was a guy that 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 would go to uh it to uh uh when they when they had these uh people that, that would, would complain about like uh getting censored you know when you said the f word you know or that type of thing jesus the f word is the first word i learned you know what i mean you know what i mean but but he would say no no holes barred you know there shouldn't be in any censorship like, like with music and, and music's not going to make you uh you know uh, go kill somebody that that type of idea so he, his whole catalog of stuff if you listen to his his whole catalog of stuff it's it's just like he just uh, ha, ha, he had a, an an open an open sort of slate and he just did what he wanted to do word wise and 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 then and he and he ha, and and the, and the the writing that he did you know was was fantastic even the the jamming that he did over the songs was was uh, was fantastic too but those little jazzy little things that he put in and and all those those runs and stuff you could tell he had to he, you have to work hard at that you know you have, you have to you have to you know 
and I just wasn't that type of guy. I wasn't that, that you know, uh, that disciplined to go sit there and chart everything out. I was more or less the type of guy that would just uh, uh, get an idea for a song and then just sort of play around, play around it where he would, he would, it seemed like he wrote everything down because even later I learned that that Steve Vai, that, that phenomenal guitar player, was actually writing it down, you know, like note for note. So he was one of those, uh, those type of uh, musicians really dedicated to that. And I was more or less, you know, the, the, the opposite in, in that sense. You know, I would write down some ideas and stuff, but I would just kind of jam around it. You know, I, I was never the type of guy, I hated having to learn a song note for note, because if you learn a song note for note and you make a mistake, everyone will know it. But if you're doing your own thing and you can say, no, I, I meant to do that note, you know, it's a, you, know, you think it's a bad note? Well, it's my note, you know. Mm -hmm. I was always that, that type of guy, <laughs> you know. So again, where the inspiration for some of the songs, and I know you get a wicked sense of humor and that, man, that plays through into the lyrics and the music and stuff like that. So what did you find yourself inspired to write about? Well, well, the funny thing is, is that even now, as I'm digging up through old songs that, that, that I haven't finished yet, you know, I'm just trying to figure out which ones that I do want to finish. Uh, and there's two different reasons. You, you write a song for the sake of, uh, of, of uh, you know, like creating a really good song, you know, and, and, you, and you forget about like the Frank, the Frank Soda image or you forget about, uh, you know, if, if you're Led Zeppelin or, or whatever. You just try to write that song, you know. So, so for me, when I was uh, recording back in the day, uh, uh, when I had the album, album um, the Saturday Night Getaway, or or I was doing the the recording for Quality Records, I, I would just come up with that with ideas like with what what happened to me when I burned my head. You know, uh, I remember someone making a joke about it about it like you need you got to get a skin graft that type of idea. So that's how that whole song started. You got to get a skin graft. And I said, well. They're going to take the skin from my ass and put it on my face. You know what I mean? You know, and that's how that, that started, you know, you know, but it's not a song that I would say, Hey, I'm going to write this song and, and present it to, to somebody. That was the closest song that, that actually got recorded that, that is sort of like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's where I'd get my inspiration from mainly, you know, high times, you know, a song like high times came from just, it, it was just basically the feeling of getting high. I mean, everyone, that, that smokes pot, he, he knows that feeling, you know, uh, and, and everything else. So that's what I did was when I, I says, well, you know, what I'll do is I'll just put a joint in the pig there and smoke it because everyone's getting high. So everybody thought it was about like, like marijuana and stuff, but really it was just about, you know, having a, you know, getting high on, 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 on life uh, basically, you know, so, so that's what, you know, but I needed something to blow up on my head. So that's, <laughs> so that's why I put that pig on. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you actually had a close call with the experimenting with the flash bomb on top of the, the whatever you were blowing up. Oh yeah. Well, that was at the gas works and you know, wow. the gas works, it was at the gas works and little did we know, I mean the, the gas works, they, they, they have gas pipes up there, you know, like in the ceiling and stuff apparently, but I was blowing stuff up there all the time and the gas works, which is a famous Toronto bar. I, uh, you know, I mean, it, you know, uh, it, it, it was one of those ones where I says, I probably shouldn't be blowing up because the ceiling is so low. And some of my musician friends on the road would say, hey, Frank, we, we noticed your soda stains. They, they'd call it soda <laughs> stains on the ceiling because, the, the, you know, it would blow up and leave a big, like, dark mark. So at the Gasworks one night, I always said, we have to make, make sure that the, 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 the flash only goes a certain certain height if you know what i mean you don't want to like hit the gas pipes and in case there's a leak or something coming out of there man you'd blow that whole place up or something so but what ended up happening one night uh of course a little alcohol mixed in with this and that and blah 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 you know and i had that round moon man on on my head oh that's what it was okay it, it, it was the round moon man this time that, that's what it was because when i got it on i can barely see anything and that's one of the reasons when i'm wearing that on my head it was actually pretty heavy and i had to balance it that's why i got a bloody neck degeneration i am in pain all the time now the, the, the neck is just it's killed because i had to balance this huge it, it was actually an old mirror ball with 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 the mirrors taken off really and, 
and then I had somebody, it was an old huge mirror ball that, that I, <laughs> that, 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 that the actual mirror were taken off and then someone painted a moon man face on it, you know? And then I gutted the bottom part out and, and I put my head in there. And then while I was wearing it, I had to balance it. So, you know, like it, it, it really puts a strain on, on, on here. And I, like I say, now I'm feeling it <laughs> all the time, but uh, that, that, that's just one of the reasons probably why, why, uh, you know, I, I got this neck pain, but a long story short, uh, the roadie had been drinking a bit too much. And instead of putting the, the regular dose in, he actually put a bit extra that night. I don't know what it is. Maybe it was an accident. I'm not sure. When I put it on my head, though, I noticed that I, I, could, I, I could feel things like, uh, like the, the powder actually on my face. I could feel it like, like falling out before it was blowing. So I was trying to get the, the, uh, uh, the, the road crew would blow that, the, bomb, the bomb up from the soundboard, you know? Right. So I, I, I was trying to get their attention. Hey, don't blow it up, you know, because like I said, I, I feel something going on in here. So I had one hand on, on, the, uh, on the bottom of it like this, and I was trying to signal to them. They probably thought, oh yeah, blow it up. And they blew it up. Wow. And that, but thank God I had my hand on there, because sure enough, that powder was actually falling down as, as it, uh, 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 you know, as, as the thing, the powder went off, it was blowing up inside and I pulled it off just in time, but it burnt my hair, it burnt my eyelash, my, my eyebrows never did grow back after that. And I closed my eyes, thank God. So, so nothing happened there, but that's what, what, what was that skin graft thing was about. It, it was very close. I, I saw a big flash in front of my eyes and I thought, oh, oh this is it. And I could smell the burnt skin. But I thought, how how bad is it? Is 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 what I thought to myself. Is is it going to be like you know? Should I go to the hospital? Bad, which I ended up doing. But it wasn't the the uh, uh, it, it didn't go deep enough. Thank God, you know, in 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 the skin. But but like the hair just kind of fell off like this. It's like woof, it's just like that, you know. And but it but it, it was one of those. That was the scariest moment. After that. Never again did that happen because you know that that was that was too close for for you know too close for comfort for sure you know. <laughs> wow, man! After that, you must have been just really apprehensive about them pulling the trigger on the on the. Well, thing. no, I I I always checked it myself. That's what I did. That's the mistake I made. You know, before I, uh, ah, who cares? You know, you just out partying and blah blah blah, and you know, and and the crew would would do it, and and it's not even their fault. Sometimes they probably. Well, they thought that it was when you're putting it in, you know, ah, it's, 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 it's the right amount, da, da, da. But when you're moving around, all of a sudden it, it starts spilling. That's not good, you know? Dude, you're just way too much committed to your craft. You're just the ultimate craftsman because I would stop the show and say, okay, guys on the soundboard, I'm having some issues here. Don't pull the trigger on that bad boy. We'll finish well, this song out. Well, so you know what? we we'll bomb tonight. <laughs> you know what? That is the problem. I couldn't go to the mic and talk because my head was inside that. Well, right. Cause you can't you see, see the things on there. Right. Yeah. And, and you mix that with, with, with the gas works, people just drinking and, <laughs> and, and just waiting for it to blow up and everyone drunk out of their minds, smoking dubs and, and going crazy. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and, and he thought I was waving. Let's get it. Let's go. Let's go. Right. <laughs> yeah. What a story, man. How did you uh, escape the, the, the drug and booze trap? Or did it get you? I mean, well, I know how, how hard it is. Well, I don't know how hard it is on the road being, but I know what it's like when you have that influence around you. Everyone's doing it. It's kind of part of the industry. You're a musician. You drink. You do drugs. Like, how did you escape not going down that rabbit hole? Well, you know, with me, it was like uh, I grew up with uh, with 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 you know, an Italian family that we had wine all the time, if you know what I mean. And, and, and if there was beer there, it was, you know, you, you, you could have a beer, you know, they just felt like, you know, you're going to find your own water line. You know, you, you'll know when to stop and when to stop. I mean, I had some, some of my relatives would, would be able to just drink like, like crazy, you know, others wouldn't, but you'd have to find your water line, you know, that type of thing. So I always sort of had that sense myself i would know i'd go i would you know be on stage and going uh gee i think i i did a bit too much th this night i'm not doing that again you know and i would i would you know for example you know like i mean that you know one night too much drinking that i i could have fallen 
crack my leg because I would jump on tables, you know, back in those days. So you kind of have to sort of say to yourself, uh, you know, where's my limit? And I had to find that. So with me, it, it was like uh, it started off that uh, uh, some of my uh, uh, fellow crew members, they would be taking like literally bags of, of pot. On, I mean, you know, li- you know, like one of those garbage bags full of pot on the road, you know, and, and they would take that and they would sell it, you know, and, and, you know, to make money, to do stuff. And, and, uh, and then I, I, I would just see them, uh, you know, like they, they would sleep all day, you know, it was one of those things. And I said, I just don't want to do that. You know? So I said to myself that, I mean, there's a time for, for, you know, for smoking and whatever it is, but if they're doing it like that, I says, I, I don't want to be doing that, you know? And then some of the other fellows, they, they would be into the blow, you know, and things like that. And I found that, that uh, I was involved with, with some friends that would come out to, uh, to gigs all the time. And, and, they, uh, and, they, and I would snort the odd thing here and there, of course, you know, and, and they would say, yeah, there's some good stuff coming in and blah, blah, blah. And they got involved in, in that part of it, in, in, in you know, getting it shipped in and, and all that, right, you know. And so, you know, it, it was to a point where, where, where you're, you're, you're getting high and, and you're, you're snorting and you're doing this and doing that. And then, uh, and, and then it comes to a point where you're, 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 uh, you're, you're, you got no money left, if you know, that, that, that type of idea. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, it's one of those things where I'm not going to spend the rest of my life just, you know, chasing that, you know. Mm-hmm. And then around that same time, those friends that kind of got involved in the, in, in getting stuff shipped in and, 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 you know, and selling and doing stuff. Well, one guy was found, a, a guy that I knew very well was found dead with a bullet in his head in, 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 in his place. And that woke me right up. Wow. And, and this was a guy that, that, Hey, every time I, I, I'd come to, uh, to uh, the gas works, he was there and, and we knew each other like personally. Right. And he had gotten involved in that. And I always used to say to him, geez, I could never do that. You, you got to watch that. That's, you know, it's scary stuff. You're getting this shipment coming in or da, da, da. And then, and then of course to sell it, they, they would cut it, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And do stuff like that. But I, I just says, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to get involved in that anyway. But when that happened, I just totally changed. I, 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 I went on the road and I, I would go and I started running to, 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 to get away from everything, you know? And my, my friends would be out there like uh, waking up and, and, and smoking and, and, and doing stuff. I'd be out there running 10 kilometers a day and then I'd come back, you know. It, it would just, it would help me, help me with my writing. It would help clear my head. So that's what, that was my therapy, you know, like during the 80, 80s when I was, uh, when I started doing later to, to get away from all that, you know. So how old do you think you are when you made that decision to start running and running from the drugs almost literally? Uh, I would say, um, you know, I, 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 I think I did it when, when, when I was uh, pretty young, I started thinking about it. You know what I mean? I, I started knowing when to kind of stop when some of my friends, uh, some uh, friends and acquaintances, they didn't know when to stop. I thought I, I did that towards my, you know, getting on to my late twenties, I guess. Okay. I guess late twenties. Yeah. Mm. You know, I, I started th- thinking that way, but I think it was like, yeah, just, yeah. I, I think it was about like 28 when, when, when he, when, when, when that friend that I knew that, 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 you know, got, got shot, it was something to do with a, a gang kind of thing for sure. You know? I don't yeah. Know. When a buddy of yours gets shot in the head, that's a freaking wake up call if I've ever heard it. That's the, that, 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 that was a wake up call, you know? And like I said, and then, and then also, uh, you know, I had, you know, like I said, my road manager would, like I say, they, they, they would be selling stuff and doing this. And I never got involved in that at all because I, I just, that's just not me. I, mean, I, I <laughs> you know, I, I can party, I can do whatever, but uh, you got to know your limit when, when, when you party, you know? Yeah. Especially if you're going on stage and it's affecting how you're coming across or how you're playing or whatever. If you take your craft that seriously, then you don't want any interference. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Talk to me about the, how the music uh, business has treated you. Are you still did it provide everything that you needed to sustain yourself? Is it still providing some level of income for you? 
Well, no. Well, with me, it's like this. It, when I, like I said, when I moved over uh, from Toronto, I had to make a decision. You know, I was playing with, uh, well, the guy, uh, the guys I started playing with, they're, they're still friends of mine, but they, they're playing with, with, with Bachman, uh, Randy Bachman. Now. Right. And, and also my, some of my old friends, it's so funny because uh, some of my old friends from Toronto are playing with, um, uh, they're called the Carpet Frogs, are, are playing with, uh, with Britton Cummings, you know? So they stayed 100% in the, in the business and, and, and they make a living at it and everything else. But at the point when I came uh, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, I played a little bit. I, I would go back to Toronto and play and, and do this, but it wasn't the same old thing. It wasn't like Frank Soda's going on tour. I mean, you know, people had, had forgotten, like, like, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, the stuff I used to do and, and, and everything else, you know, it's not like I'm going to tour anything new and whatever. And I kind of wanted to get away from that. So the best thing I did was I was at a gig, um, I think it was coconuts here in Vancouver. And I was telling my friend that, that, uh, he had just moved. Well, he's not, he wasn't a friend, but he became a friend, but he, um, he uh, came up to me and said, Frank, I, I saw you in Ottawa. I, I was in Ottawa there and blah, blah, blah. And uh, uh, he says, uh, so how do you like it here in Vancouver? I says, well, I like it here. I says, I just, I don't feel like traveling too much anymore. I got a family, you know, you got this and that. And, uh, and he says, well, listen, I'm a supervisor at, at, at Canada Post. They says, you know, maybe, you know, you should think about doing this and that. Maybe get in. You can get a part-time, you know, gig there. And then you don't, you know. Make a long story short, I ended up uh, putting my resume in, and uh, and and he uh, he said, "Well, you got to have some kind of resume," and I had zero work experience. So what I did was I just wrote the resume like, like I was a road manager for a rock band, <laughs> you know, because basically I, I did it at, at the beginning, take care of stuff like that. So I was a road manager and blah blah blah, and sure enough, they gave me an interview. I walk in and the guy that was interviewing me, he says, you're Frank Soda. <laughs> so he knew me from, 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 uh, from, from Ottawa days or from back East days and stuff. And I still keep in touch with the guy, by the way, he, he was a, a higher up in Canada post. So sure enough. So they hired me there. And this is what is helping me right now in my retirement is that I get, a, I get a, a pension from that. I was able to still play music like on, 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 we, on weekends, I was still able to take time off. If I still wanted to, I would go every year and play with, like I say, uh, uh, the Max Webster guys and, 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 uh, and, and some of my old um, uh, bandmates there. I, I would do shows at the Rock. I could still take time off to do tours. I could go, uh, uh, when Thor came back, moved back up here to Vancouver, I would go out tour with him a bit. But I was able to sort of keep my... Uh, uh, keep my, my seniority number with, with the Canada Post. So when I, I, I retired early and stuff, but I'm able to have a little bit of a pension coming in from that. So between that and, uh, and, 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 and stuff that I do with Thor, I do some recording with him. I've done his last six or seven albums, you know, and doing stuff. Uh, uh, it, well, there's not a heck of a lot of money in, in the heavy metal scene or nothing, but it, it was fun. It kept me, you know, you know, uh, writing, creating and doing stuff and keeping my fingers moving. And then on top of that, I did a, uh, a, a little duo that we, with my wife, like we just played like classic cover stuff that we just enjoy doing. Cause that's, that's a big scene out here in BC pubs, you know? So I just did that and learned how to MIDI all the instruments so I could just go out and play, oh, Really, okay. you know, I did that. So I, I had to, I had to kind of like really diversify, you know, you know, just so, adapt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what do you see as a challenge today for the up and coming bands as far as, you know, uh, technology and the differences between the music industry back then and the music industry today? We know the obvious distribution issues and stuff like that, but also you can, you can become famous overnight really by just putting a serious jingle together or getting picked up by a commercial or something like that. You know, how have you seen the industry changed? Well, to be honest with you, yes. Uh, it's good and bad. Uh, I, I think that uh, the opportunity is is there. Like I, I uh, another thing I've done is that I, I've 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 helped. Like uh, there's this young musician 
uh, that I've helped. His name is Kerry Badgley, but he used to come over to my house. He's a friend of my son's and he was creative and, you know, and, and he was always trying to do stuff. So I helped him. He's done a few like CDs and, and, and recording. So I try to help these young people like the, like, uh, you know, to produce their music and give them insight in, 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 in songwriting. If they don't, you know, uh, quite have a song that's quite there yet I can help them out and there was another a girl that um, ha had a lot of potential th that I met in, in, in one of these uh, sessions we do these like sort of jam sessions out here I met her and she was a phenomenal singer uh, she had she had everything like as far as like looking uh, she did all the uh, anthems at uh, at the Vancouver Canucks games you know and and the bc lions and she could she could sing well and she wanted to start a career and the i i said to her i says the first thing you should do is you should send a demo and so i helped her get a demo and do stuff and then when i would go back and forth from toronto i'd bring it to uh uh to some people that i knew like like out east and and i'd say well listen this girl here's her here's her uh demo here's her picture here's her promo blah 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 well the first thing they said was just tell her to go and, and get like something, a heavy social media presence. That's what they said. Heavy social media presence, get like uh, cameras in there, singing and playing, having this and that, and then start doing that. Then they'll take an interest. Wow. So that's what you have to do these days in, in order to do that. Uh, or else you just sit in your basement. There's phenomenal people just sitting in their basements that can just sit there and just go, you know, no, not a problem. You can do that all day long, you know? But if you want to be a Justin Bieber, that's what you got to do, or 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 or, or, or any band, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. The one man bands like the Beck. Um, I've got a guy I interviewed a couple of weeks ago who's one of a legend to me, but was virtually unknown. His his name's called well, it's Mike Anderson. He's his his act is called Strange Juice. Oh yeah, Strange Juice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He um he was inspired by Beck and the midis and the laying down multiple tracks so he does the drums the guitars the bass he does everything and multi-tracks it and and records yeah. it in his basement like it was in his home studio and oh, yeah the, for me uh calling lucy was the the uh the song that hooked me i don't even know where i found it but he's virtually nobody online like he's got hundreds and hundreds of songs but you know, he hasn't played live since 2012, and he was inspired by that. That you know, he said, "I saw Beck doing it from his home," and I'm like, "Whoa!" Are, are you talking about Beck, the, the guy, uh, the guy that uh, you, you, uh, you you talk about Beck that did? Uh, uh, I'm gonna kill myself. What was that song? Uh, yeah, loser. Yeah, yeah, I'm a loser, yeah. baby. I love that song. Yeah, well, I'm he does. Baby. His, yeah, he's a one man show. He's a one man so, band. He plays. So why don't you kill me? That one there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, he's fantastic. He's got some great stuff. I've just done a deep dive into his uh, stuff lately too. But, you know, he uh, I was talking to Mike the other day on an interview and he was saying, yeah, I just saw how Beck was doing it. And I'm like, geez, I'm going to try and do that. And it's amazing. Well, that's good if you can do that. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah, but. I think uh, that, that that is the way to do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to close out with you uh, letting us know what you're up to now, what could be coming up in the future. But um, I'm interested a little bit about, you know, your family, your parents, what type of home you lived in, you know, like how were you brought brought up and then who'd you marry and who are your kids now and all that kind of stuff. Let people know what your life is all about. Oh, sure, sure. Well, like I said, I, I grew up in, uh, uh, in, in Kitimat up north uh, in a, a, Italian, you know, my, my, my parents were Italian. And like I said, my dad was very, very uh, educated, very, uh, you know, s you know, he'd speak English, he could do stuff at, 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 at the time, he was musical, he could play, but he always tried to keep me away from it. So that's how I grew up. My mom, on the other hand, I was very close to her because she's always going, oh, come on, come on, just let him do this, let really? him do that. Okay. So it was one of those, you know, things. And finally, of course, my dad gave up on me and my mom said, okay, well, if you got to go hit the road and play guitar, go ahead, you know, that type of idea. So I grew up in that, but it was actually, I, I kind of enjoyed Kitimat because there was a, you know, there, there was a lot of, uh, uh, when, when the Beatles came out, there was a lot of bands that, that would play like, like the sock hops, you know, and, and I, I, I first went and saw, uh, you know, musicians playing at these sock hops. I said, yeah, I, I, I know I, I can do that. I'd love to do that, you know. 
so it was nice growing up in in in, in a town where where there was a lot, lot lot of music going on to be honest with you i mean it, it was a small town but but every time i turned around there was there was a battle of the bands which i ended up getting involved in mm -hmm. and then we ended up winning the battle of the bands and we had a a band uh, from Denmark one year was um, were the judges and they had just come off tour with the cream. And that really, that, speaking of inspiration, that, that really, man, that opened the whole doors to, uh, door to like, what the heck is that guy doing? You know, he's just jamming all this blue stuff. So, so it was, it was a great opportunity there, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and I still have uh, a, a sort of contacts up in, in, uh, in Kitimat that I still keep in touch with, you know? It, it, was, it was a small kind of town that was kind of close together. They remember me playing and I remember them from from, from the days. And uh, one fella, um, uh, uh, Jerry up there in, in Kitimat, he uh, was a singer in a band that I, that I knew. And 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 Harry Crawley was, uh, was the guitar player who had moved from, I think, Scotland or whatever. He was a really great guitar player. And later I found out that he had passed away and uh, you know, so these are people that, that I, they, they, they helped shape, but like, like, you know, my playing, they helped shape what I wanted to do, you know, mm -hmm. but the family growing up, like was, you know, like I said, it was just a typical, typical uh, Italian family in a small working town. That, that's all it really was, you know, oh. and then, you know, breaking my mom's heart. As soon as I could hit the road, I grabbed my guitar and I hit the road, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, uh, but like I said, for, for, for music, uh, these days, like I said, mainly I'm just trying to dig up old songs that uh, or, or ideas that I had and trying to put it together. But the problem that I have is that with the COVID stuff that, that's hit, it gets pretty depressing sometimes because I, I, I see like, what's going to be the end result? You know, what, what do I really want to do? You know, so I'm, I'm always second guessing, ah, should I do this? Should I do that? So that's what I'm going through right now myself, to be honest, you know. What, I, I was more a live type of player, you know? Oh, right. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So putting together a studio album isn't all that much inspirational for you. Well, the thing is, is that the guy that I, I worked with here, he just moved uh, moved up to Kelowna area, you know? Uh, Ray Roper used to play in a band called Stonebolt. And for the last 20-some 20, 20 years, I've always been going out with him and, and, and recording and doing stuff. And that's how I work best. I don't work best when I'm sitting in front of a screen like this mm -hmm. and then putting ideas on and mm, is this, I like working together with somebody. And it's the same okay. when I, when I did with uh, like Mike Tilka from Max Webster produced Saturday night getaway album. Oh, he did. Okay. Example, like I, I work good going, okay, I got this. And then he say, okay, I like those ideas and I go home and work on them. I like doing it like that with, 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 uh, with, with somebody else, you know, Mm -hmm. it's not like i'm i'm todd rungren or like frank zappa you know what i mean i i hear here's what i'm gonna do and I, i've always been that type of guy i like bouncing stuff off you know right and and how i used to do it in my touring days was we just we would do stuff and just bounce it off the audience live we'd, we'd play a song called tv people here we are all we play it. and if they like it okay then we keep it in the set you know that type okay. of idea i still kind of kept that you know that philosophy you know how many songs you figure you got down how many songs yeah what was the your his, the history of your career how many have you got that you've put together oh geez yeah. i i have literally got like i mean while my albums alone i've I, 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 like i mean oh, I, I have got like probably like uh like uh, 150 songs really but the ones that are finished you know i i would say maybe I'd say maybe 45, 50, maybe tops. Wow. The ones that, that, that are really, like I say, these are the ones that, 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 that have been out. Oh, oh. Oh, one sec, I just got to cancel that. Sorry. <laughs> <Again. Okay. laughs> uh, you know, so, so it, it, it's like this. And also I have songs with, with, with other people that, that, I've, that I've written and, and you know, uh and 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 helped or, or you know like some of the, the 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 these younger people that i've helped with with their with their writing mm -hmm. and 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 the the thor stuff i've got quite a few on there i uh with thor the last since you moved back from north carolina or south carolina there uh and in the 90s you moved back and i i was recording with him but uh i i found that like like the some of the songs like the 
they we recorded we, we just to the point where we, we were demoing the song and then and then it didn't go any further than that you know so but uh i i i recorded guitar on his last say six albums and i still keep in touch with him so he we may do something else in the future too you know what's the connection to the metal queen brother Lee oh, Aaron. Lee Aaron? Uh, another Karen? one of my, geez, she was a yeah. legend when I was a kid, man. I've got a few of her albums, man. Well, you know, she's, she's just a really nice, really nice lady, you know, super nice. And, uh, and I, I met her when, when we were at the Gasworks playing and my manager, one of the manager, her band, you know, she looks phenomenal, sings phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So she came out to the Gasworks and, 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 and would do stuff. And she ended up, singing on one of my uh projects that i was working on yeah, you guys had a manager. show together didn't you pardon you had a show you know, together didn't you we, we did the adelaide street uh, the, the, the adelaide street theater whatever it is that one there with with uh with lee aaron uh myself and then uh, uh members of mox i think yeah moxie was there uh the the, the so singer frank soda show right yeah it, it was the frank soda show and then but lee aaron uh, it, it, it was, it was there with her band Mm -hmm. And ironically, the guitar player in her band ended up uh, becoming um, uh, a guitar player in in, uh, in in Los Angeles, and I'm I'm back in touch with him as well too. He, he, he think I think he uh, uh, Rick Springfield. He played with Rick Spring. He ended up playing with Rick Springfield. I go, what the heck is he doing there? <laughs> so we're in touch, you know, doing that. No, no, she's she's fabulous. She uh, she did some recording on my thing and then on her first album uh, my my manager says uh we're gonna get rick emmett of triumph we're gonna get you and we're gonna get uh, a couple other people like local toronto people and i wrote a song for her on that and i gave that to her so you know we we, we just sort of been you know kind of connected ever since you know like and so even wow. when she moved out here i still i still see her she's done a couple of these fundraiser things with uh, with me that that i uh that i kind of you know, put together every year with with uh, Ray Roper and a few other friends of mine. You know, yeah. awesome, my brother. It was so good to talk to you and um, and to meet the legend. I know it's on Zoom and stuff like that, but this is what it's all about now, man. So, and you know, I don't think I'll ever get used to hearing you say my grand kill my grandchildren. I'm like, what? Well, Frank Soda can't be a grandfather. It's not possible. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I know. It's it's. Yeah, it, it, it's with this COVID stuff, the way it is, you start reassessing your life and you're going, oh my God, look at this. Like I, now, now I got, I got, I, I got it one grandchild. That's all I have. You know, oh. and I got two kids. Yeah. Speaking of the family, mm -hmm. I met my wife, like when I was touring and stuff like that. I met my mm -hmm. wife and she, she was kind of a singer and, and I met her when I was touring, but, but at the time that I was touring, she was just, she was with someone else. And so, so I didn't even know her at that time. Uh, and then, and then a couple of, you know, then you go back and forth and you, and you tour, the next tour comes up about four or five months later and, and she wasn't with that fella, you know, that type of idea. So that's how we started something, you know, we started communicating, you know, she was in Winnipeg there and I was in Toronto Okay. and then it ended up that, uh, you know, we hit it off. We, we were, I, I was at, at about the right time when, when, uh, I, I kind of was sick and tired of, of you know, all that same old going back and forth, you know, crossing, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, too much partying and stuff. And we, we kind of had that same headspace. And then we ended up with, with, like I say, two kids. And then, you know, we, 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 we raised the, you know, when I came over here, we raised the kids, we still played music. I still, you know, recorded and, and, and got to tour back and forth. So we, we still kind of managed to be able to, to do like like all the things we wanted to do, you know, without having to be like the Frank Soda show on the road type of idea, you know. Right, right. Yeah. So I kind of fortunate in that way, you know. Family's everything, man. What do the kids do? Okay, so my my son, to be honest with you, my son, right now he's he's running ten kilometers a day, at dressed up as Santa Claus, for the twelve days of Christmas. <laughs> That's what he's doing right now. Because my son, you know, he ended up, he's been one of those guys that he, he was a very talented, he could play music and do stuff, but I never pushed him into it. I didn't want to do like, what you know, I, uh, that you have to play it to play. Mm -hmm. But he was very good at playing. He could do stuff, but he never really, you know, 
took the effort to say, I'm going to sit down and really, you know, spend my time in it, you know. So he's been going from job to job and, you know, spinning his wheels, blah, 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 you know. And he ended up like doing security is what he ended up doing, you know. He's 33. Like he ended up doing security and that kind of kept him going. He would work uh, Rogers Arena once in a while over here, like in, in Vancouver. And then he worked the festivals that, that happened. But when the COVID hit, all the festivals, you know, all the festival, all that stuff totally got canceled. What he ended up doing was he ended up like uh, uh, getting with his covenant house and, and he became their Santa that, 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 that that's, that, that's running throughout BC to raise money for this charity and stuff like that. So that's what he's doing at this point. So hopefully when, you know, when this COVID stuff, you know, uh, you know, is over and stuff, he'll find himself something else to do. <laughs> And my daughter, she's actually a nurse. She, she, she just got her LPN nurse just before uh, this COVID hit, which was good. And then she's working at, at, at like a care home up. And, and it's really bad. Like there's a care home up here at the street here. And, and the, there's infections and everything. So it's not good, you know, as far as that goes. So, But she does all the precautions. She wears all the gear. She wears all that stuff. She immediately comes home. She takes a shower. You know, doesn't even come in and say hi. You know, that, that type of thing, you know, just in case, you know, mm. so yeah, what's that, the impact that's been, my family. What's the impact been of that on you and your family? Um, you know, there's so many people struggling with mental health with the, the COVID. Yeah. Like it's been, a, it's been a challenge for many people, whether it's just now we're covering our faces. I'm not sure how healthy that is not to be able to see somebody's expression on their face. I mean, there's so many. I, I don't know. Like I said, I, I, I don't wear the mask when, when, when I go uh, outside in the fresh air, uh, un, unless, uh, unless there, there's a gang of people like, you know, it, it, you know in, in a certain area or something like that, I don't wear, wear, wear the mask. I feel like, you know, that, 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 but if I have to go somewhere where there's tons and tons of people, whatever it is, I, I just do it because that's what you're supposed to do. I don't know whether it, it is, it, you know the the the, the thing, but you know I do it. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, but the effect is this: is that I find that with COVID, it's like it's like prison. It, it's like you. It, it's just like if if someone says to you, uh, "I'm, I'm going to send you to prison," you know, you're going to have four walls there. You're going to stay there, but but that's the negative side. But the positive side is you can do anything you want. You you can get an education. You can learn an instrument. You can, uh, uh, you know, you, you can, you can uh, study whatever you wanted, been wanted to study all your life, or, or you know what I'm saying, right? You know, but the problem is, is that it's, it's the paradox is that you, you're, you're in the prison and, and you, you have no, no, in, no inspiration to do anything. So you got all the time in the world. That's what I feel I got now. All the time in the world to do whatever you want to do, but no inspiration to do it. Mm. that's that's the way i feel it, it, it is locked down well if you ever get in a studio that's got the uh, you know you can plug into the zoom and get your music in there and you put, plop the box of beer down in the middle of the room and you got all your friendlies and you know bang out five song set or something like that call me i'll carry you and i'd love to see you guys you know what it's i'm i love the bloopers i love the behind the scenes stuff and uh, I was talking about Strange Juice, Mike Mike Anderson. He hasn't played since 2012. And I'm like, dude, but he says, uh, Jimmy, I got to learn all my songs again. Like, I, I, I make these songs. I don't play them forever. I have to go back and actually learn them before I can play them live. And I'm like, dude, put three easy ones together. I'll carry you live. I just, for me, I just want to see the guy play. So, yeah, if that ever, be, if you ever find yourself in a studio with broadcast ability, I'd love to pick you up. Well, you know what? Maybe, maybe we can do that because my old, uh, the guy that I did the Saturday Night Getaway album with, he's uh, actually doing something on Zoom. He's playing bass with, on an international uh, an international uh, a field of musicians. They all submit their their stuff by Zoom. See, I, I I haven't done that, but but he he he'll play bass on on, on this song, right. and uh, and and someone else in Scotland is is playing a mandolin. Someone else in in London is playing a, a guitar. Someone else in Chicago is playing, and they put it all together like that. So what I, what I one of the things I was thinking of doing is that when I was talking to some of my people when when I'm recording is picking certain songs that I can have like maybe the guys from Max Webster be guests on yeah. on, on one of my songs maybe that like speaking of St Catharines uh, 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 the, the Derry is the guitar player of Honeymoon Suite 
he used to come to all my shows when I when when the imps used to hit St. Catharines. It was a place called Howard Johnson's, I believe. It was Howard Johnson's, the Montebello. I don't know if you remember those yeah. those clubs. But anyway, we used to play there, and he was a local local boy. But but I might send it to him or Gary Lalonde. Hey, play a little bass on that. So get some friends, you know, to sort of contribute that. But I'd have to get uh, a bit more up to date with with the, like you said, like ha- having, being able to do it like with Zoom, like but. Between like the people that I know, I'm sure we, we can do something. So who knows? Maybe that might happen. <laughs> I love you, my brother. I appreciate yeah. the time, man. It's uh, great to meet you. And uh, I appreciate you telling your story. So uh, thanks for the time. Thanks for being so accessible and kind. You're like, yeah, I don't know about Zoom, but I'll try. <laughs> I'll try. Like I said, this is my first This is my first Zoom thing. So you know, hopefully in 2021, maybe, uh, I, I, like I said, I usually head back east. Like I say, with uh, with the with the, the Max guys and and, and catch mm-hmm. up with all my old bandmates. So if, if that happens, I'll definitely we'll we'll have to hook up. Look you know? me up, man. I'll be right. uh, I'll be in the front row, just like 1983. <laughs> well, let's do it. All right. Well, nice nice talking to you, Jim. All right, brother. We'll talk again soon. I appreciate it. Uh, okay. Bye. Thanks, brother, man. Peace. Bye. <laughs> all right, bro. I'm gonna cut you out here. And uh, close out the stream. We're still live, but uh, man, I appreciate your time and your generosity. That was so cool. And uh, yeah, we'll I hope it was okay. Like I said, you know, is this this is my first time doing anything like this? I I've done this before with uh, my friend that is helping me with with uh, with my my uh, when when I was trying to get my studio going again, like you know, because I hadn't really used it. Like I say, it was my friends using my friend's studio all the time. Now I got to go in there and the technical part, I'm sort of terrible at it. So I got the protos, I got this. I had to do the Zoom thing in order for him to help me. Okay, now you got to do this, Frank. You got to do that. So that I have been using it for that, but that's about it, right? You know? <laughs> Great, man. I uh, hope your family's healthy and I hope you live forever, my brother. Well, that's listen, all the best to you and yours, okay? All right. Cheers. All right. Talk Talk soon. Okay, bye. I better go walk the dogs now. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. See you, Soda. Okay, see you. Yeah. See you, Jim. <laughs>